Okay, well, thank you for the opportunity to um, present to Midas. Um, my name is Richard Scantlebury. I'm an Associate Director at Houston Consulting. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about uh, practical design of structures on metros, particularly bridges and stations. Um, and most of the examples I'm going to give are going to come from Jakarta MRT, which is a current project for us as a company, which is currently under construction. Uh, so this is what we're going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to give uh, a very quick introduction just to myself and who we are, and then a description of the project overview. I'm going to talk initially in the first half of the seminar about um, just a quite a high level overview of how we go about designing viaducts and analyzing them, and similarly how we design and analyze the station structures. Um, really from a kind of quite a general sense, so what the main priorities are and how we use MIDAS to do that. And then um, in the second half of the seminar, I'm going to talk in a bit more detail about two particular aspects uh, which are, have dominated in particular the Jakarta MRT, so the seismic design and analysis. And then also just talk quite briefly about um, rail structure interaction, which is something which affects a lot of metro projects. But I think often as structural engineers, it's something that we don't think about until quite late on. And then right at the end, I'll just draw together a couple of thoughts um, from our experience of what are the kind of headline priorities or the conclusions that we draw from these kind of projects. So before we get into it, uh, very briefly, a quick introduction to who we are, Houston Consulting Engineers. So we are um, primarily a bridge and civil structural engineering company um, doing design consultancy. We're about, we've just passed our 10-year anniversary a year or so ago. Uh, we were established initially in 2005 by Nigel Houston, and uh, we now have offices, our main offices in the UK in Guildford, but we have sister offices in Kuala Lumpur and Hong Kong. Um, and we have designed bridge and metro systems uh, across the world, so we're working on projects in Africa, the Middle East, Central and Southeast Asia, and of course in the UK as well. So in the UK, we're looking, we've been doing a lot of work on Crossrail, which some people may be aware of, uh, and we're now giving up for High Speed 2, which is the next sort of major rail project coming in the UK. Most of our work is with um, contractors. So from a design and build point of view, we also do some temporary works and some construction engineering. And it's very much with that in mind that we've been using MIDAS since very early on in our history. We find that it, um, particularly from the kind of construction engineering and the bridge focus, uh, it's very good. So that's a little bit about who we are. Um, some brief overview about Jakarta MRT. Uh, this is a fairly typical picture taken uh, by one of our design coordinators in Jakarta. If you've been to Jakarta, the first thing, or well, one of the major things you'll notice is traffic, and you can see that in this um, picture. So traffic is a major problem in Jakarta. Uh, it can go from being totally clear roads to gridlock within a matter of minutes. Uh, and when I say gridlock, I mean it can take hours to get um, quite a short distance. And looking at the statistics, that isn't really that surprising. It's a huge city. It's got a population of about 10 million. It's not particularly dense. It's spread over quite a large area. Um, and putting Jakarta together with the other towns and cities around it, to so looking at the greater Jakarta metropolis, it's got a population of about 28 million, which is the fourth largest in the world. Um, and yet, most of the infrastructure at the moment, most of the public transport is road-based. Um, so you can get taxis, buses, minibuses, tuk-tuks, but in terms of rail, there's very little. There was a commuter metro built um, over 100 years ago, which brings people in from further out. But in terms of suburban and um, metro systems within the city, Jakarta MR2, which has been constructed at the moment, is the first. And it's very much part of a um, drive from Jakarta authorities to uh, build more MRT systems in order to improve their infrastructure. This uh, plot just shows the plan over the next uh, few years or couple of decades, I would say. Um, the lines shown in blue are future planning of MRT systems. So um, what's now highlighted in red is phase one, which is the first half of what's known as line one which will run north-south. And this is, the, this is the part of the project which is being designed and constructed at the moment. Um, it's about 15 and a half kilometers. 
to the south it's elevated and to the north where the kind of station dots go green uh, it's underground so it's in tunnel the intention is to then extend that with another six kilometers of phase two running north south um, further to the north of phase one and then in the future an additional line phase three which will run east west a much longer line um, to bring people into the city from much further afield in terms of um, Houston our design package the design package we're working on is package CP 103 which is highlighted on the screen there uh, and just to give you a little bit more information about that um, in total it's about four kilometers um, although because there are merging spans and diverging tracks in total we designed about 4.7 kilometers of viaduct deck uh, and it contains four elevated stations so running from south to north Hajinari, Block R, Block M and Sasinga Mangaraja and the thing to say about those stations is that three of them uh, are very similar in their structural layout Block M is unique and I'll talk about that a little bit in a second uh, so as I said, 4.7 kilometers of viaduct decks. It, the tender was undertaken in 2012 and we began design at the end of 2013. And the intention is to complete uh, the civils for this package in 2017. The whole of phase one has been left with design and build contracts. Uh, so for CP103, this is the arrangement. The client, MRT Jakarta, who uh, are overseeing the whole project and will take ownership. They have JMCMC as their engineer, and for package CP103, the DMB contractor is a joint venture of Obayashi, Shimitsu, and Jaya Constructi. Um, and then from a design point of view, we are undertaking a similar structural design. Uh, architecture and M&E in the stations is being undertaken by Arkinin, who are a local consultant, and independent checking is being undertaken by Cinetech, who are Taiwanese. So quite an international uh, team. To give you a feel for um, the layout, this is uh, just north of Sasinga Mangaraja, so this is just to the north end of our package. Um, and this is the road layout at the moment, this is where the viaducts will go. And what you can see at the north is that this is quite a wide stretch of road, so the light grey in the middle is a dedicated guided busway. Um, and then there are two sets of dual carriageway on the outside. So in that case, plenty of room for construction down the middle. To the south of CP103 is much more congested, so uh, you can see this arrangement here. Buildings on the right and the left very close to the edge of the existing road, and the existing road is dual carriageway with a small median down the middle, about a metre and a half median. That's a very common problem in uh, existing cities. The question then is where do you put the metro system because there simply isn't spare land to build it at grade. Uh, and the common solution is what's being employed on Jakarta MRT, which is um, this. So the viaducts will be placed, will be elevated, and we're supported on central piers running down the median of the existing road, um, with the median being widened slightly. So a very standard arrangement from that point of view. Through the stations, one of the innovations that we bought at Tender, um, this is a typical section through one of the standard stations. So Blocka, Hajinari, and Singa Mangaraja all adopt this arrangement. And what you can see here is that we're actually continuing to run the viaduct deck through the middle of the station. Um, and that's an in innovation that we brought in during Tender, and that enables the construction of the viaduct to be continuous so it doesn't have to break at the stations. And then around that is constructed the station structure. So um, the road level carries on underneath. The first level above road is what's known as the concourse level. And that's where um, you'll buy tickets, go through the gate line. There'll be a small amount of um, commercials, so shops, uh, toilets, and that kind of thing. And then higher up, the um, escalators, lifts, and stairs take people up to the next level up, which is platform. And what you can see here is that the platform is partially supported off the viaduct decks. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in the future, so later on. The exception, as I said to that, is block M, which is a slightly different cross-section. In this place, the, um, the tracks diverge. Typically, there's one track going in each direction. 
but through Block M there are three tracks and that allows for trains to terminate uh, and turn around at Block M. And, but the philosophy is the same, so concourse level you can see you can see vertical transit up to platform level and entrance structures off to the side which enable people to, to, to enter and exit the station to and from the pavement. Um, and again, very congested, buildings very close on each side. Um, so a lot to fit in in the existing space. just want to talk um, briefly before we go into talking about design analysis, about the design criteria that we're using. So uh, in terms of the loading that's applied to all the structures, um, there's obviously permanent loads from uh, the self-weight of the structure and uh, from pre-stress. Um, and then superimposed dead load, non-structural dead weight, which on the viaduct comprises things like trap plinths and ballast and cable troughs and parapets, and through the stations, uh, includes plant equipment, uh, finishes, uh, ceilings, that kind of thing, and cladding. Um, so permanent loads, and then on top of that we have service live loads, so the train loading, which in our case is um, passenger trains are 20 meters long with four axles per carriage, so each carriage is 20 meters long, um, and then four axles per carriage, each of which carries a load of up to 140 kilonewtons, so 14 tons. And then we also have designed for the possibility of a maintenance vehicle running on any track, which is a shorter vehicle, only 10 meters long, but with higher loads. So a much more concentrated load. And actually, we're commonly finding that that governs the design. So we have vertical loads from these axles, which are listed above, and then we have horizontal loads in addition to that from uh, traction and braking, and um, secondary distribution of vertical loads due to things like lurching and lazing. And then in the station, of course, we have uh, live loading from pedestrians uh, or passengers as well as from the train loading itself. Environmental loads, obviously we've got wind applied to the structures, both the stations and the viaducts. It acts horizontally on the structure and also on the live load, which is passing over the structure. And it acts vertically on the decks and on the roofs of the stations. And the wind speeds are listed there, and as is common with this type of structure, the, the wind speed is limited when combined with live load. In other words, trains just won't run when the wind speed is above 21 meters per second. So that isn't designed for, but the structure without live load is designed for that higher wind load as well. Then we designed for temperature change, so a uniform temperature change on the whole structure and differential temperature change, particularly for the viaducts where the top of the deck uh, heats up or cools down quicker than the rest of the deck, that sets up a system of stresses uh, inside the structure uh, as defined by uh, the design codes. Then in addition to that we have loading that I'm going to talk through in a bit more detail later on, so loading from track structure interaction and seismic loading. I'll talk about those in a lot more detail, so I won't go into those now, except to know that for the seismic loading, we have two levels of seismic um, consideration, so a serviceability earthquake with a 100-year return period, and an ultimate level earthquake with a 1,000-year return period. We're using British standards uh, for package CP103. In fact, I think British standards are being used for all the elevated packages. Um, the employer's requirements stated that it had to be international standards, but a number of people have opted for British standards, as have we. So that's BS 5400 for bridges and the equivalent buildings codes uh, for the stations. And for foundations throughout, we're using BS 8004. The, the, what's not covered by the British standards is seismic loading, because um, there's very little seismicity in the UK. And so in those cases, we're using Eurocode um, to supplement the British standards. So we're using Eurocode 8, uh, which is general and buildings works, and Eurocode 8 part 2 for bridge works. Um, those actually sit very well alongside the British standards, and they also are modern codes and therefore represent the kind of latest in seismic design. Then for track structure interaction, we're using the UIC codes, which I'll talk about later. And in addition, the client has requested some additional checks um, particularly to under seismic performance checking using the Japanese codes, 
and then some additional checks using the Indonesian local building codes in order to gain local building approval. So that's the, the kind of overall design criteria for the whole structure. I'm just going to talk a little bit about how we've designed and analysed the viaducts and then do the same thing for the stations. So in terms of the viaducts, the, the priorities when we're developing the concept for the viaduct, what structural arrangement and what construction method. We think about constructability in terms of being able to, we're building a long length of viaduct and so we want to be able to build spans quickly. We want to minimise the in situ works partly because that improves quality by maximising off site construction and also partly because in, a, in an arrangement like, um, in a city like Jakarta, transporting in situ concrete to site can be difficult because of traffic, so the less we can do on in situ, the better. And we want to have a construction method which utilises locally available equipment so there isn't a risk to the contractor of you know, very bespoke plant having to be brought in from a long way away and the risk if that was delayed. Obviously quality uh, is a priority and again off-site construction and repetition enables the contractor and the precaster to build up their own expertise. Um, and very much it's a case of coupling technical skills with uh, simplicity in order to produce a design which works technically but is also uh, can be built to a high quality uh, by local workforce. And finally, of course, price because the, the tender was competitive. Um, we want to minimise quantities uh, and we want to use local materials where possible to avoid high transportation costs. So the solution um, which was adopted at tender, which is very common for these kind of MRT projects, was to use span by span precast segmental viaducts. Um, the picture you can see is actually taken from the MRT in Kuala Lumpur, um, but this is the philosophy that spans are, are erected by gantry um, and each span is formed of precast segments, so in our case up to 12 segments per span. Um, there's an overhead gantry which, in the, in the case of the first span, stands on each column and then lifts the span up. And then in future spans, the gantry launches forward so that the front leg is stood on the next pier and the rear leg is stood on the deck that's previously been erected. Then the individual segments are then bonded together, sorry, have epoxy glue applied at their joints and are then stressed together using, in our case, post-tensioned internal pre-stressing strands although external tenders are very common as well. And in the case of the substructure, I'll talk about a bit more in a second, but we're using precast spun piles uh, with in situ reinforced concrete par caps and piers, in situ reinforced concrete pier head, and then elastomeric bearings uh, between the deck and the pier head with an additional restraint to prevent seismic movement, which I'll talk about later. So for precast segmental, the priorities then are standardization. You want to be able to do the same thing again and again and again. That enables you to build up quality, but it also enables you to use the same moulds for as many segments as possible. So we're looking at standardized geometry as much as possible. We're looking to standardize details like blisters, anchorages, connections. And we're looking to standardize uh, the pre-stress in terms of tendon arrangements, duct positions, particularly the duct positions at the joints because those affect the mould used to cast the segments. And we're looking to standardise reinforcement arrangement. And of course in all this we're looking to minimise concrete quantities because um, so much of the total load on these structures is permanent load. If you can minimise the concrete quantity you will minimise the amount of pre-stress required. So there's a kind of double saving that occurs there. The other thing to, to bear in mind with precast segmental is that the segment sizes are generally governed, their length is generally governed by being able to be transported. Um, and so they're typically sort of three to three and a half meters long. So on Jakarta, this is an elevation of a typical span. So our typical span length, which is also our maximum span length, uh, is 36.65 meters. And in that case, we use 12 segments per span. For all our span lengths, we use the same diaphragm length. Uh, and that enables that to be totally standardized. So those um, segments which you can see in green, they are always the same length for all span types. 
And then you can see the different segment types within that. The, those shaded red are segments which include blisters for pre-stressing, and those shaded yellow are those which don't include blisters. So that standardization. And that's repeated through all the different span types. Then in terms of the pre-stress in the bottom slab, we're anchoring some of the tendons on the diaphragm, so you can see those that, that run the full length on the box. And then we're anchoring some within internal blisters. So the total amount of pre-stress is maximum at the mid-span where you need it the most to resist the bending moments, and it reduces towards the end. And the important thing to note with um, gantry erected span by span is that, in this case, all tendons are stressed from the end furthest away from the span which has just been erected so that there is space to install the jacks for the pre-stress. In terms of cross-section, this is our typical arrangement. So um, the, the majority of spans are double track as shown on the left. So we have one track going in each direction and it's centrally located over the box. The tracks sit broadly over the webs uh, and then we have space for cable troughs and parapets on the side. And then in some cases, which I'll talk about later, we've seen the example through Block M Station, we have some boxes which are only required to support a single track, and those are as shown on the right. And the other thing you can see on the right is that in some cases the track centre line moves across the deck, um, so it's eccentric to the box centre line, and I'll talk about that a bit more in a second. This slide is just included uh, again to show that um, the poles that you can see coming out of the sides of the deck, the vertical poles, are required to support the overhead line electrification, uh, which is known as the OCS. And where possible, those are installed in line with the diaphragm in order to minimize the amount of additional load at mid-span. But we've been coordinating very closely with the track work contractor to agree where each of those OCS poles go because they add additional weight to the structure. This slide then is just a, a sort of half plan on the top and an elevation on the bottom of our typical pre-stress arrangement. Uh, it's probably not at a scale where I can really go into too much detail, but broadly speaking we generally have two tendons which run the full length of the box and then additional tendons which are anchored at the internal blisters and as I've said that provides the maximum uh, pre-stress at the mid-span where the bending moment is greatest and reduces the pre-stress as you come towards the end of the box to suit the bending moment profile. A relatively brief word about the substructure arrangement. In, we've had quite a lot of dialogue with the contractor about preferred substructure arrangement and as I mentioned earlier they're very keen to use um, local equipment In the ultimate case that we have sufficient bending moment capacity provided by the pre-stress, uh, 
and um, that we have sufficient shear and torsion capacity uh, to transfer the load back to the bearings. In terms of the transverse design, there's no transverse pre-stress in these decks, so um, all the slabs and the webs behave as reinforced concrete sections. And we check those again, we check them at serviceability, but in this case we're checking for crack widths and material stresses, and then we're checking for ultimate capacity of bending and shear that the amount of reinforcement provided is sufficient. So in terms of how we do that, um, longitudinally we model each span type um, in Midas. We do that uh, with a model like what is shown here. Um, you can see that we're providing nodal positions at each of the segment joints and we're providing nodal positions at the bearings as well. And then the bearings are connected to the deck via elastic rigid links. So beam elements, typically because uh, that enables us to use, um, sorry, to extract simplified force results, which we can then check. And it also enables us to use quite simple construction staging modeling in MIDAS. We, we have beam elements which represent the longitudinal members with the appropriate section properties applied. As I've said, we put our nodal positions at the segment joints. And this is just a personal preference. We actually model the beam position at the top of deck level and then in MIDAS you can effectively offset your section so it sets everything out from there and that makes setting out pre-stress and that kind of thing a lot simpler uh, but whichever way you do it you just have to uh, make sure that what you're doing is consistent so if you set out your beam positions along the centroid you then need to set out your pre-stress arrangement relative to that and then you can see elastic rigid links, three of them at each end, uh, which transfer the load from the beam top to the bearing level and then horizontally to each bearing position, which enables us to get uh, bearing forces out simply and also correctly models the rotation of the structure relative to the bearings. Section properties are input um, from AutoCAD XF format. Uh, through the section property calculator tool in Midas, and as I said, we we prefer to apply a kind of center top offset, but you then have to make an allowance to account for any cross fall that you've got on the slab. Um, we're using time dependent concrete properties, which is um, important for the construction staging and for determining long term loss and movements. So losses in the pre stress and movement of the deck due to creep and shrinkage. Uh, and there are a number of ways you can input pre-stress and tendons into uh, MIDAS. You can do it through DXF. Uh, you can input them manually directly into the program. Uh, or you can uh, use spreadsheets, which then export through the MCT code directly into the program. Whichever way you do it, the, the crucial thing is to check uh, that the results are sensible and look correct. And I'll talk about that in a second. But that's a relatively easy thing to do. And then we, we account for the construction staging, so the staggered stressing of different tendons.
explaining a few of the ways that we do that. Uh, with pre-stress, it's, it's actually very simple to check pre-stress losses, particularly the immediate pre-stress losses which come from friction and wobble, and those are defined by standard formula. Um, I've included one from there from Eurocode 2, uh, but that's a very standard formula. And pre-stress losses from wedge slip, elastic shortening, and relaxation. And then in terms of checking the long-term stresses, we would expect losses due to creep and shrinkage typically to be in the order of 10 to 20%. In MIDAS, you can export very quickly from the results the um, tendon force profile at each stage throughout the design. And that enables you to check those kind of things very simply. One of the things it also enables you to check, which is what I've shown here, is you should have a smooth transition of force. And you'll, you'll see the losses coming into play wherever they're kind of curved up. So in the example at the top of the screen, you can see losses occurring at each end of the duct. And that's where the tendon curves up into the blister. But what will happen, it's very easy in MIDAS, if you, particularly if you define a tendon at two points which are close to each other, to effectively get kinks uh, in the model. And that will show up in this tendon loss graph. And I've shown that on an example uh, at the bottom. So you can see um, very uh, immediate pre-stress losses occurring at a number of places. And that tells us that the pre-stress profile is not in the model correctly and that we need to go in and smooth that out. Um, so it's a very simple tool and a very easy way to check effectively whether the pre-stress forces that we're getting are correct and therefore whether the pre-stress tendons and jacking effects are being correctly modeled Another thing, particularly with simple spans, that's very simple to check uh, is the longitudinal stress at a given part in the section. Uh, it's very simple, particularly at mid-span, uh, to, to check what the bending moment should be. If you know what the pre-stress is and you know the eccentricity, it's very simple then to check the top and bottom stresses in the model using the formula uh, which I've shown on the screen. For simple spans, that is a very, very simple check. Um, but it's essential in order to have confidence in the stresses that are coming out of the model. So that's what we do for longitudinal design. And then moving on to transverse design, uh, we do things slightly differently. So we, we build a thick plate element model of the full span, although we don't put the, the pre-stress into this span because it doesn't affect the transverse effects. And then again, we're going to check local shears and bending moments. We're going to check deformations. We're going to check reactions. And particularly if you're combining loads and miners, it's imperative to do a hand check of at least the first few results you, need, you use to ensure that the combinations are acting uh, correctly, particularly if you're using envelopes, that the correct things are being picked up. In this model, we, we apply the load um, using pressure loading, which we put in the worst case on the span at whichever section it is that we're going to be checking. So in this case, uh, we would either be checking the effects near the mid-span, where you can see that the majority of the axles are, or at the near diaphragm, where we've put two axles in line with the diaphragm. Um, and then we apply those as pressure loads. We multiply them up by a dynamic factor to account for those effects. And we, we allow for the force being spread out through the track plinth or the ballast. The pressure load should account for lurching or nosing effects. Um, and as I've said, we tend to put the pressure loads as static loads in the most critical position. Uh, but you can also run a full moving load analysis, of course, with those pressure loads if you want to get the worst case at every point during the span. But the reality is that the transverse design uh, will always be worst in line with the axle. And so there's not quite so much requirement in this kind of check to do a full moving load analysis. From that plate model, we can extract contour plots, but perhaps the more the useful thing is cutting diagrams, which you can see in red, as I've shown below. And they enable us to understand, I think, a lot more intuitively and directly than the contour plots, exactly how the bending moments and shear forces are varying uh, transversely through the section. Um, so we then check, we, we undertake a reinforcement design for combined effects so for the, for the cantilever slabs, they need to be designed for the combined effects of moments and shears in the transverse direction. And for all the elements which form the box, so the two webs and the bottom slab 
and the top slab in between the webs, those elements will take the combined effect of local bending in the transverse direction, local shear force in the transverse direction, but also they will contribute to carry, in the case of the webs, longitudinal shear and torsion, and in the case of the top and the bottom slab, uh, longitudinal torsion from the global model that we looked at earlier. Then having taken all of those results out, it's just a question of designing the reinforcement in accordance with the codes, whichever codes of practice it is that we're using. Uh, just a note about diaphragm design. Um, the diaphragms resist very high local forces from the bearings, which are then transferred effectively back to the webs, and also from any tendon anchorages. Um, they can be designed using simple hand methods, so it's very common to design those using strut and tie. In order to, do, to undertake a more thorough analysis, uh, diaphragms really need to be modeled in 3D uh, and in some projects we do that. The, the screenshots you can see on the right are not from Jakarta and Martina from a different project um, in which it was necessary particularly because of the external tendons um, to model the diaphragm in full 3D and that can be done in Midas FEA um, particularly at SLS I think if you want to understand what the crack pattern is going to be and whether some bars particularly around pre stress or anchorages are going to be working especially hard. Uh, that 3D analysis in FEA, particularly nonlinear analysis with reinforcement, uh, can be very helpful. Just to note to say that um, we, we group as much as possible the spans that we design, but in some positions it is necessary to, map, to design individual spans um, uniquely. So particularly in the example of the span I've shown below, this is a span which I'll talk about later on, uh, but in this case the track actually moves quite eccentrically across the box, um, which itself is tapered, and that merited uh, a bespoke design for this span. So if there are individual loading or geometry or special track positions, those spans should be considered separately. In terms of the self-structure analysis, I'm not going to spend a lot of time looking at this. There are two real ways to design the peers. The simplified method is to design the peer in isolation and to effectively apply the bearing loads uh, directly to the top of the peer. And by applying combinations of sort of maximum and minimum bearing loads on either side, you can pick up the maximum bending forces and axial forces which will occur on the peer and foundations. The more exact way to do it is to model um, a longer run of model of peers, as you can see on the bottom of the screen, and effectively to run a moving load analysis which runs over all of those decks. That's a much more time consuming analysis, but it enables a much more accurate prediction of the variation of bending moments and axial forces with their um, coexistent effects which occur at each peer. So that is kind of quite a high, high level overview of what we do in terms of the viaduct design and analysis. Um, just a brief word about station design and analysis. I'm not going to go into quite so much detail here because fundamentally the principles are similar. Uh, this is our typical station arrangement as I said before, so the viaduct deck carries on through the station and the station structure itself is then effectively constructed around that. Um, Again, it's founded on multiple multi-pile foundations. And one of the key parts of the concept of this, particularly with seismic design in mind, is to reduce the amount of mass with height, so to have as little mass as possible, particularly as you go higher up the structure. So in this case, we have a reinforced concrete substructure, and the, con the concourse level is also uh, reinforced concrete. Uh, the precast viaduct deck through the middle, which we've already talked about, the platforms are composite, so steel concrete composite, and they are part supported on the viaducts and part supported on the roof columns, as you can see in that section. And then the roof itself uh, is steel. It's formed of CHS steel truss members, which I'll show a bit more in a second. In terms of the plan, this is a typical plan. Uh, I said that we have three stations that are identical, and they all look very similar to this. Um, so at concourse level, the body of the concourse is shaded red. It's a reinforced concrete 
beam and slab arrangement. Uh, the entrances you can see are RC um, as well, and they provide access from the street. And then moving up to platform level, the platform, the length of platform which is being constructed now is shown in green, but provision has to be made for future extension in case longer trains are used, um, in which case the platform will be extended as shown in blue. And while those aspects aren't designed at the moment, the rest of the structure has to be capable of taking that additional load. And then a vertical circulation between the concourse and the platforms is provided by lifts, escalators and stairs, which are shown in those blue boxes. In elevation, um, this is what it looks like with the same colour coding, and you can see the roof as well, now shaded purple, and that roof extends over the existing platform level, but again, the structure has to be designed so that the roof could be extended in the future if the platforms were extended into those blue areas. A block M, it, block M is similar, but slightly different in that we have these three rails and therefore three decks, each of which support a single track. And the other difference of block M is that the um, roof, rather than being a steel truss member, it is, it is steel CHSs, but it's then got a stress fabric PTFE roof. Um, which we've designed, which goes over all three decks and the platforms. And the result of the arrangement with the split lines, so having three lines going through block M, is that the platforms and the roof are actually entirely supported from the, from the viaduct decks, and you can see that there. And we've had to um, be very careful with how we've modeled that in order to pick that up, particularly in the seismic um, situation. Other than that, it's a very similar arrangement to the standard um, decks, so you can see the concourse slab shaded red there with entrances in orange either side. The platforms um, are island platforms in between those tracks, now shaded green, and again we have to design for the potential to extend those platforms in the future. Um, and vertical circulation again provided between the concourse and the platform areas via stairs, lifts and escalators. What's, um, either side of block M, the track transitions from uh, being a, a double track, so one track in each direction, to that arrangement that we see in, through the station where there are three tracks which are separated. So effectively running from left to right, uh, the tracks diverge and merge as shown very simply in the red lines you can see there. So on the left hand side we have the typical arrangement, one track in each direction. And then through a system of points merge and diverge uh, to come up to Block M station where there are three individual lines. And we need to provide structure which supports all of that and, and matches that geometry. And in order to do that we've provided um, a system of tapered fired up boxes underneath that which use the same technology, they're still precast, they're still using the same double and single track arrangement, but with top slab tapering in order to pick up that rail geometry. So that's the arrangement of boxes that we end up with. Um, the double track boxes that we're using are shown in green, and the single track boxes that we're using are shown in yellow. And by doing that, we enable the same construction technique to be used right through the package, which um, has significant benefits for constructability. What it does mean, particularly in those areas where you can see multiple decks next to each other, is that they need to be supported on bespoke uh, substructure. So one example I've given here uh, is a T-pier. Um, again, so the, the pier itself stays in the middle of the road, uh, but by using pre-stressed and reinforced cantilevers extending out, uh, we pick up those diverging boxes. And there are a number of those through the approaches to block M at either side. Um, some are pre-stressed, some are reinforced. And in the case where we can put a, a pier down on each side of the road, some are portal structures. In terms of modeling the station itself in Midas, um, this is a typical section through our Midas model. Um, so we have the foundations, which are modeled as six-dimensional point springs, which represent the multi-part groups. We have the concourse, beam elements, and plate elements, uh, and we have the decks, which are the same as modelled in the viaduct design. Platforms are modelled, as I said, they're steel beams with a concrete in situ slab on top, and because they're supported of the viaducts, they have they are linked uh, to 
represent that structural connection between the viaduct top and the platform edge. And then the roof itself is modelled using uh, beam elements and it is a 3D truss, which I'll show you in a second. So stripping all that back, taking the fleshing off, uh, you can see in particular around the viaduct deck quite a complex arrangement of links. And those represent um, the connection between the viaducts and the bearings, the connection between the viaducts and the platforms. And the kind of diagonal links you can see higher up are actually seismic restraints, uh, which limit the relative movement of the platform and the decks under a seismic event. So this is just a 3D image uh, showing the roof truss. Um, and if you look very carefully, you can see bracing down some of the sides. Um, this is the same thing showing the platform with the uh, supported off the viaduct decks, which runs through the middle. And then finally, the concourse with the entrances modeled in, um, and piers and par caps. And the foundations, as I said, are modeled as six-dimensional springs underneath each of those par caps. In terms of uh, loading, well, the self weight is applied automatically because uh, Midas understands what the mass of the structure is. We then apply superimposed dead loads to account for finishes and particular equipment, uh, especially plant, heavy plant. We need to know where that is, and we've modeled exactly where that should be in the model. And then imposed loads due to train loading, pedestrian loading, uh, thermal and wind loading, as I talked about earlier. Um, and generally, We've applied floor loads as um, line loads on the adjacent beam members, which we found simplifies the modeling quite a lot. In that, obviously, that then underestimates the load in the slabs, and they have to be designed by hand. Um, the alternative, of course, is to apply pressure loading direct to all the slabs. Um, again, it's personal choice. It's just a question of following through whatever that decision is. Then having run the model, uh, we extract the results. So um, we, we want to design by grouping elements as much as possible. So rather than designing each transverse beam individually, they, because they carry very similar loads, um, we group those together. And part and parcel of doing that is to um, renumber your elements as much as possible in Midas. So it's simpler to extract the results of common elements. We verify the results by simple hand methods, so checking reactions, checking bending moments, checking shears on the primary members. And particularly when you're using elastic links, um, we spent quite a lot of time going into detail to verify that they're behaving as they should be. We then export the results and we design um, using spreadsheets, so member design to the appropriate British standard uh, and also to the Euro codes where we've got seismic effects. And in the case one of the interesting things about this is because the bridge structure through the middle of the station is designed by using the bridge code BS5400, whereas the station structure is designed using the building codes, um, we just need to be quite careful and we uh, spend quite a lot of time defining at the start how we would effectively in the calculations pass loads from one to the other and what load factors we would apply. And then finally we check the deformations to make sure that they are within the allowable limits from the building codes, particularly in terms of protecting the finishes, uh, which is one of the main considerations for buildings. So that, that's a high level, uh, quite quick overview of what we've done in terms of the viaduct and the station designs. I, I want to spend a bit of time talking about the seismic design because that's been so dominant on Jakarta MRT and and so often is when there's stringent design criteria. And then I'll talk more briefly about track structure interaction, which we've also looked at later on. Um, so in terms of seismic design, I'm sure you will be aware that um, seismic, sorry, seismic forces on the structures are caused um, by earthquakes, which in turn are caused by tectonic plates moving relative to each other. And uh, what you can see in this, um, screen is that there is a large fault which runs right to the kind of south and west side of Indonesia as the Indo-Australian plate meets the Eurasian plate and it's, it is a significant and active fault. Um, the result of that, if we look at the map of seismicity for the area, is that Indonesia as a whole is 
um, highly seismic. Um, interestingly, historically, through Jakarta, the actual magnitude of earthquakes has been relatively low compared to the rest of the country. But looking at the seismicity of the whole area, you can understand very much why the client is so keen to ensure that seismic design is properly accounted for, uh, to ensure that this is a long-term, sustainable, uh, and safe project. So um, very broadly in terms of how that works, I, and to be totally honest, I took this um, picture off the internet, but I think it shows really well um, basically what's happening. So the process which generates movement or acceleration of the bridge is that at the fault plane there's a movement, so a movement between those two plates. And that the resultant movement or um, wave that comes from that moves through the rock at low level and then up through the shallow geology, um, which in the case of the Jakarta MRT, uh, most of the shallow geometry is clays and sands. And as it does that, the response uh, changes. So the actual acceleration that's in at the bridge site or the station site is highly dependent on the geology um, and the geotechnics through which that wave has passed. Uh, but effectively, what we're therefore saying is that seismic load fundamentally is about the ground moving and the bridge or the structural response to that. So to idealize that, we could think of that as looking um, a little bit like this. So this is highly idealized. But we've got our mass, which is our viaduct to our station, um, which is connected to the ground through uh, a substructure which has both a stiffness and a damping. And to that system is applied a movement X. And what we're trying to understand is what the response to that is in terms of relative movement of the structure, Y. This is a standardized case, which obviously applies much wider than bridge engineering. But the standard solution to that uh, is what's shown on the next page. Um, and what this is showing is the magnitude of the, the ratio up the Y axis of um, the ratio of the structural movement in response to the applied movement, and that plotted against um, a variation in frequency along the bottom with one representing the natural frequency of the system. And the main point of showing this is to show two things. First of all, that um, with increased damping, the response to the system reduces. And secondly, which we know, that the response of the system is highly dependent on the applied frequency of loading relative to um, the natural frequency or the modal frequencies of the structure. So in terms of applying that uh, to our seismic design, we want to consider horizontal ground movement in uh, any direction. Um, and we generally do that by modeling in two orthogonal directions and then apply a combination of those. That's the method prescribed in the Euro code. In some cases, we then want to model a vertical ground movement as well. although some structures don't require that, and that is code specific, so it's worth checking that very early on. And in terms of how we analyze that, well, to the U of code 8, there are um, three common methods, and I'll just go through those very quickly. The first, the most basic method, um, is what's known as a lateral equivalent force. So this is a static analysis where horizontal loads are applied. Um, which simply represent the seismic effects. So there's no dynamic analysis here, um, and there's no consideration of the modal frequency. That's a very simplified assessment. It's worth noting that it's in the UK it's only applicable to building structures, and it's generally applied in cases where there is very low uh, seismicity, such as in the UK, for example. But it's clearly too simplistic for what we're doing, major infrastructure in a highly seismic area. The other extreme, the kind of um, the much the most uh, elaborate method, if you like, and certainly the most um, the one that requires the most processing power, um, is a nonlinear dynamic time history analysis. And in this case, we model the structure nonlinearly, um, so with nonlinear materials. Uh, and we actually apply to it a, a um, range of accelerations which represent a real earthquake or artificial earthquake, which are um, 
scale appropriately. And the, the model actually shakes the structure so it applies acceleration at ground level which varies with time and then it records the response, the dynamic response of the structure with time. Um, and that then provides forces and displacements throughout the seismic event and by considering a number of seismic events appropriately scaled, uh, we can then determine an envelope of forces to be used. A couple of things worth noting on this. So um, Eurocode 8 part 2, which is the bridge part, uh, specifies that uh, that this method can only be used alongside a response spectrum analysis um, to provide insight into the post-elastic response. Um, and it also says that generally if you've done a response spectrum analysis and then you do a time history analysis, you shouldn't use that to relax the results that come out of the response spectrum analysis. Um, and that leads us on to this middle approach, the kind of standard approach I would say, the one that's most commonly used, which is a modal response spectrum analysis. This is a linear analysis, so it's a simplified um, assessment. But the input is a response spectrum, which is a relationship for a given area of seismicity of the acceleration of the structure relative to the modal period of oscillation. Um, the example at the bottom is a response spectrum from the Eurocode, but on Jakarta MRT, a site-specific seismic assessment was undertaken. Um, and both Eurocode, sorry, Eurocode 8 parts 1 and 2, so buildings and bridges, um, recommend the response spectrum analysis um, as a kind of standard case for high level of importance structures. And so it's appropriate for both bridges and stations on Jakarta MRT. It's a simplified analysis in that it's linear and it's not time dependent, but it provides, certainly provides sufficient accuracy. Um, and in this case, it's run based on project specified spectra although we do verify it with simple methods. And that's the major advantage, I think, of the response spectrum approach, is that it enables simple checking to be undertaken. And I'll explain that in a second. So the way it works, this is a very simple um, explanation, but the way it works is that um, the finite element software assesses through an eigenvalue assessment what the individual modes of vibration are uh, for a particular model. And for each of those, it, it assesses what the period of oscillation is and what the mass participation is. So what proportion of the total mass in the system is being activated by each particular mode. And then using the response spectrum, which we've input, for each mode, it can then t determine the appropriate acceleration by reading off the graph for the period of oscillation for a particular mode. And the force can then be determined because it knows the amount of mass participating and the horizontal acceleration. And the effects of all those different modes are then combined uh, by a method which is determined by whichever standard you're using. Um, and typically, uh, that is either the square root of the sum of the squares or the combined quadratic equation. Um, but if you're designed to the Eurocode, there's a good section in Eurocode on which of those methods should be used, and it depends on how close your modal frequencies are to each other, and effectively whether their responses are overlapping. Uh, so in terms of how we do that in MIDAS, uh, this is one of the models that we've used. This is the model which shows block M station, and you can see the merging and diverging areas either side. Um, we need to model all of the geometry, and in particular we need to model a number of spans away from whichever station or span it is that we're looking at, because the interaction of different elements is crucial. Um, we need to understand the stiffness for a long distance away from whichever part it is that we're looking at, and the mass, and we need, need to understand how those structures are connected to each other, uh, either by the rails or link slabs if we have them, or bearings or seismic restraints. And at the end of the model, we need to think very carefully, if we just suddenly stop modeling, what we've chosen to do is then to put in a spring which effectively represents the viaducts which will carry on past the extents of our model uh, to ensure that we're not suddenly getting a huge movement at each end of the model, which isn't realistic. And all of those things affect the dynamic response. So in terms of what that looks like um, for our models, uh, these are the main, main features in a seismic model. Um, 
so starting at the top and moving counterclockwise. Where, where there is a structural connection between the decks, we need to model that. So, for example, if there's a link slab, um, we need to use the dynamic elastic modulus of concrete, which is typically about 25% higher than the short-term modulus, although those are defined in the codes. Um, we need to think about whether we're going to include the effects of the rails, because those will structurally tie the system together. And in our case, we modeled the rails for the serviceability earthquake, um, but for the ultimate earthquake, we allowed for the fact that the rails may have broken or yielded, and therefore we took those out of the seismic model in order to be conservative. Uh, we're using dynamic stiffnesses, so of bearings and also of the ground. Um, and for the columns, you need to pay some careful consideration to whether those are cracking or not under the seismic case and whether the stiffness of the section should be reduced accordingly. Seismic restraints, um, as I've said before, we provide a seismic restraint between the top of the pier head and the diaphragms. Um, and that looks like this, what's shown in red on the um, figure below. And that is a, a reinforced concrete um, upstand which passes through the diaphragm. And it's heavily reinforced uh, to, to resist seismic load. Around the upstand is a gap, um, and that gap allows for service movement. So under service case, the um, seismic restraint will never engage. But under the seismic event, the magnitude of movements and forces which we would get would be too high for the bearings, the elastomeric bearings on their own to resist. And after that, after the relative movement exceeds that gap, the seismic restraint then comes into contact with the diaphragm um, and prevents the bearings against excessive movement. So the true response of that is nonlinear in that the, the force between the diaphragm and the seismic restraint is zero until that gap is closed up and then it's a direct contact. Um, so the question is how to model that in a linear response spectrum analysis. And Eurocode 8 provides guidance for this um, and what it recommends is that you use an equivalent linear spring but that the stiffness of that spring is iterated so that after, so that under the seismic loading, in this case and the clear gap that we have is 20 mil. So we want to check that the relative movement of that spring is 20 millimeters uh, under the full seismic loading. And so what we've done is we've put in a horizontal spring which represents that seismic strain, run the analysis, checked what the deflection is, and then iterated the stiffness of that spring in order to get the correct movement. And that's what's showing in the figure extracted from Eurocode 8 um, at the bottom of that slide. In terms of how we then apply the um, response spectrum in MIDAS, um, well, the eigenvalue analysis in MIDAS will automatically calculate the dynamic modes. And the key thing here is to say that we need to activate as many modes as possible or as necessary in order to provide 90% mass participation in all directions. That's a requirement of Eurocode 8, but it's a very common requirement for seismic analysis. Um, so check whichever code you're designed to. In our case, that meant modeling about 300 modes per model. And then we can define the response spectrum in MIDAS. So you define the spectrum via the define function feature, and then you define load cases which use that function. So in particular, if you want to apply the same response spectrum in different directions, you'll have multiple load cases, each using one function. Um, and we then run the analysis, and the result of the dynamic analysis is the mode shapes. This is an example of one mode shape, um, which is activating the viaducts either side of, sorry, on the north side of one of the stations. Um, yeah, and you can see what Midas is doing. So it's picking up um, what the relative movements of the structure are to one another in that mode. The nice thing about these graphical representations is that it enables us to understand which peers are being activated by each mode. And on the right-hand side, halfway down, you can see that the natural period of that mode is about 0.9 seconds. So in MIDAS, we determine the mode shapes and we determine um, what effectively the fundamental modes are. 
and for each mode, models will show us the frequencies and the mass participation. And as I said before, we then need to check against the design code for the response spectrum analysis to ensure that the method we're using to combine those modes is appropriate. And I've extracted clause 4.3.3.3.2 from Eurocode 8 part 1 on the right hand side there which talks about when it's appropriate to use different methods. And in particular, often the default method for adding modes is the square root of the sum of the squares. Um, and Eurocode 8 allows for that but also urges caution and places conditions on that to check that and if necessary it can be necessary to move to something like the CQC, the complete quadratic combination, instead. We can check from MIDAS, if you go to results tables and then vibration mode shapes for each mode, it will tell us the frequency of oscillation and it will also tell us the modal participation, um, so the mass participation for each mode. And why that's helpful is because, particularly when you have a large model, um, the first modes might not necessarily be the ones that are vibrating the most significant parts of the structure. And so that enables us to look down the table and see which modes are activating the largest portions of structure. And generally it will be those early modes activating a significant proportion, so 3-4% or more, which are governing the force results. And using that it's very simple with the response spectrum analysis to do a ballpark check of what kind of forces we can get out because having taken the modal period out of those tables from MIDAS, we can then read that off against our response spectrum that we've input. So in the example I've shown here, um, I've drawn the orange line which represents the modal period that I might get out of MIDAS and then I can read that across on the response spectrum and the acceleration might be for example 0.4 G. Then I can go into the results in my list and I can compare the ratio of the horizontal force to the vertical load for that particular pier and I'm expecting it to be in the order of 0.4. Obviously it will, it's only approximate, it will vary particularly as some piers shared load to each other because they will have slightly different relative stiffness. But it's a very good, it's a very quick but simple check uh, which enables us to get a higher level of confidence in the results of what's coming out of the response spectrum analysis, which otherwise can be quite difficult to interrogate. So having done all that, once we've got confidence in the model, we can then extract the envelope of forces for all uh, elements. We need to be careful then in order to set up sufficient combinations within the model or in external spreadsheets in order to ensure that we get the right or sorry, the most onerous combination of forces in all directions uh, from the seismic analysis. Um, and it's then essential to do hand checks on just the first few to make sure that your combinations are working correctly, particularly if you're combining everything directly within MIDAS. Um, the, the seismic results are um, a magnitude, so they are effectively reversible. So you need to be careful as you're combining them with other permanent effects which have a sign to make sure that we're picking up the worst case. Having done all that, we need to think about what the aims are in a typical seismic design. The nature of um, the nature of the loading type, as we said before, is that we want to try and provide ductility in order to resist the high movements that we can get under seismic design. Um, design. But we also want to try and reduce the seismic forces as much as possible, thinking right back to those theoretical curves of um, the magnitude of the response movement to the input movement and how it varies with frequency. And we can reduce the seismic forces basically by trying to move down that response spectrum graph. So um, fundamentally by increasing modal periods uh, and that will move us down the response spectrum graphs and graph and reduce the acceleration. Um, the other way to reduce seismic forces is to find a method in the system, the structural system, which can release energy because that effectively will introduce damping. Um, and the typical way to do that is through um, material hysteresis, so to allow some aspects of the structure to yield. Um, and as the as the 
Um, for example, reinforcement is loaded and unloaded, and in particular as it yields, we see a hysteretic effect as shown on the right hand side, and energy is dissipated as the stress strain curve um, for unloading is slightly different to that for loading. So that uh, shaded area in the middle there represents energy dissipated. And we can take account of that to say that that um, release of energy effectively reduces the seismic forces which are acting on the structure. So if we if we got in terms of a seismic design, thinking about the ultimate state earthquake only, the typical criteria for an ultimate limit state earthquake is that the structure can't collapse, that it can incur damage, but that, that damage has to be repairable. And the typical um, thing to do then is to allow for plastic hinges to form, in the case of bridges, typically at the pier base, because that's the repairable um, position. And if plastic hinges form, to allow for the fact that that energy is released through hysteretic effects, the codes allow for uh, a lower earthquake loading to be applied. And the way that is applied is that um, the earthquake loading calculated from the response spectrum is divided by a behavior factor according to Euro code 8, uh, which is termed Q, or other codes use R for response factor. And to Euro code 8 for part 2, for cantilever piers, uh, bridges can use a Q value of up to 3.5 if, if plastic hinges are occurring and if yielding of reinforcement is therefore can be relied upon to release energy. So the plastic hinge is then designed for that lower load and the rest of the pier and foundations are designed so that they are stronger than the hinge. And by doing that, it ensures that energy is released, which allows for that lower load, but it also ensures that the damage will be at the pier base, which is repairable, and particularly that the damage doesn't occur in the foundations, which aren't accessible. Um, so just to run through what the process for that looks like, um, we would analyze the structure and we would take out our unfactored to our full earthquake loads from um, the analysis. And we would then design the base of the pier, the plastic hinge, for a reduced load. So the um, bending moment that comes out of the analysis divided by the behavior factor, Q. Um, and we account for that, and I'll mention this in a second, by applying particular detailing rules in that area that ensure that even though that yielding occurs, um, collapse doesn't occur because the, the system retains its residual strength. Um, it's worth noting that in Midas you can actually put a scale factor in a set a scale factor uh, directly, which accounts for Q. Uh, so either you can put your scale factor in as one and divide the results you get at the other end uh, by Q, or you can set the scale factor at the start so that the results you get out of Midas are already scaled down. And either is fine, but the key thing is to remember which one you've done so that you don't end up scaling things down twice. Um, so having got that, we then designed the bottom of the pier um, as a plastic hinge uh, so that the capacity of the pier is capable of resisting that reduced moment. Having done that, we then want to calculate what the actual capacity of the pier base is because we're going to design everything else to be stronger than it. So the capacity of the pier with the actual reinforcement is then calculated with material factors set to 1. And the rest of the pier and substructure is then designed for a system of forces which are back calculated based on that capacity at the pier base multiplied by an overstrength factor, which for reinforced concrete in UK8 is 1.35. So having done that, what we theoretically achieve is a is that we can rely on the pier base hinging and therefore releasing energy, but we can also ensure that the rest of the system is at least 35% stronger. And at the pier base, then, we apply particular detailing rules, uh, which I've shown here an example from Eurocode 8 Part 2. And basically, this is about providing additional confinement reinforcement to protect the concrete in the core, so within the reinforcement, to make sure it doesn't blow out, um, and also to protect the reinforcement as it yields in both ten tension but also in compression to make sure that it doesn't buckle or burst out of the section. So that's the process we would go through if we only had an earth ultimate um, earthquake or if that was governing. On Jakarta MRT, 
We've also got a serviceability level earthquake, which I mentioned before, which is referred to as level one. Um, and the criteria under that is that no damage may occur under that serviceability earthquake. Uh, and we achieve that by ensuring that the structure remains elastic and that all materials remain within stress limits that we've defined. And we also have to check that the relative movements of the rail uh, are limited um, to ensure that basically the de derailment of the trains doesn't occur during a serviceability earthquake. And those deflection checks have been taken from the Japanese standard, um, particularly which I think are actually written for high speed uh, rail, which were revised after the Kobe earthquake. And then we also have a level two ultimate limit state um, earthquake in which there's no collapse, obviously, and damage can occur but has to be repairable. And the thing to note on Jakarta MRT is that the, the level one earthquake is actually about 50% of the level two. Um, and that's significant because it means that the level one earthquake actually governs. So if we work through the process I discussed before with a Q value of 3.5, typically that will result in um, ultimate level seismic or level two shears and moments, which will be about 50% of the full response spectrum because we've done because we've reduced by a factor of 3.5 but then we've multiplied up by an overstrength factor based on the actual capacity of the section. But in our case the level one earthquake is already about 50% of level two and it has to be resisted within the elastic capacity of the section. And the result of that is that we have to put so much reinforcement in to control stresses under level one that under level two we find that hinges aren't forming that the section isn't yielding. And so we can't then rely on that to dissipate energy and we can't use a higher Q value. And so effectively, it can't be defined as ductile to Eurocode 8. And Eurocode 8 then specifies a kind of um, a, what it calls limited ductility, which is in cases where hinges don't form, um, for peer moments, you can still use a Q value of 1.5, so a much reduced Q value. And that allows for the fact that material hysteresis occurs even within the elastic range to an extent. But peers have to be designed for shear and torsion uh, using the full response spectrum, Q value of one, and foundation is the same. And that, it's worth noting on Jakarta, that has dramatically increased material um, quantities, foundation sizes, peer sizes, reinforcement. And I think it's just worth being aware of that, particularly if um, we're using or specifying a serviceability earthquake. When the serviceability earthquake gets to the point where it governs the design, that fundamenta fundamentally changes the approach and it will result in a dramatic increase in material quantities, which may be appropriate, of course, if um, a serviceability earthquake is likely and is going to be of the magnitude that's predicted. But I think it's worth it both from a client perspective and from a designer perspective, we need to be very honest with ourselves early on about what is driving that. So that was an overview of the seismic design and analysis. And I just very briefly before we finish want to talk a little bit about rail structure effects because um, often I think that we as structural engineers we focus on getting our um, bridges or our buildings to work structurally. But of course with an MRT system um, or a metro system, what's of fundamental importance as well as the structural performance is that um, the trains function properly and that the, the performance of the rail uh, isn't compromised. Um, and actually the behavior of the structure and the rail are fundamentally linked, so they are physically connected either through the ballast or the track fixing. Um, and the dynamic response of the structure has an impact on their power local load. So as the structure vibrates, as the train loading passes over it, that changes the apparent uh, loads applied to individual members of the structure. We also need to check the deflection of the structure under the track to make sure um, that passenger comfort is ensured that the, it's not a sort of bumpy ride as the train passes over piers and then over mid-span and then over piers again. And also to ensure that the stress in the rails um, is always within allowable limits. And we also need to consider how loading, in particular sort of lo longitudinal loading is shared between the rail and the structure because the, the rail effectively forms 
a structural link between all our individual spans. In order to do that, we've used um, the British standards. Uh, sorry, the British standards reference the UIC code, um, particularly with regards to track structure interaction. Um, and in some cases, we've done additional checks um, regarding the dynamic response. And we've used some of the other UIC codes you can see listed there. Listed there. And as I've mentioned before, under the seismic loading, which again UIC doesn't cover, we've used some Japanese. Um, RTRI standards in order to check rail deformation um, under that case. So first of all, just a word about dynamic loading. Uh, rail loading is, is by its nature dynamic. It's large forces coming through the axles which pass over at a particular frequency, which is dependent on the speed of the train. And that, that effectively that dynamic loading results in a higher, um, higher bending moments and shear forces that you would than that you would otherwise get if you considered it to be static, um, as the structure effectively responds dynamically to the dynamic load that's being applied to it. And the standard approach to that is to apply a dynamic factor, um, so to model everything with static loads, but then to apply a dynamic factor onto live load. So um, for MRT loading to be a specific 100, that comes out as a dynamic factor of 1.2, um, except in a few unusual circumstances um, where it can get, be slightly higher or slightly lower. And for heavy rail, the factor varies based on span length and can actually vary between members of any particular bridge. And for a typical span arrangements and geometry, that will satisfy uh, the requirements of the URC curve, so the URC code. In our case, for some of the special spans, particularly through those merging areas where the decks are wider or the rail is eccentric. Um, we've done additional checks to see uh, how the response compares to the dynamic factor. And we've, seen, we've done that using the UIC code um, 776.3 and 776.2. Um, it's worth noting this is, that's not a requirement of the British standard, but more than anything it's, it's something that we've done out of interest to see um, how those kind of structures respond. Uh, you are, one of those codes specifies a kind of upper and lower limit on span deflection as the live load passes over it, and um, the, the other specifies limits on span frequency, and both of those are concerned with ensuring that the dynamic response is within the range assumed by the dynamic factors uh, being applied. So those are the criteria that are presented in those curves, the one on the left, those codes, the one on the left being for uh, deflection limits and the one on the right being for natural frequency limits. Uh, and in our case, as I said, some of the spans we've got are quite unique in their geometry. Um, they've got eccentric train load or they've got long, sort of wide top slab cantilevers. And um, we've looked to see that the local dynamic response um, is still within those ranges that are specified to be okay in the UIC. So, um, this is one of those spans in as an example, which I've actually shown before. Uh, you can see the track in this case is quite eccentric, and you can just about make out that on the kind of far side, the left-hand side, the width of the top slab varies as we're going along the span. So those are the things we're interested in. Um, and in order to do that, we've applied uh, the train loads as they actually are uh, onto a plane model. Uh, what you can see here is a plan uh, of those results, and what's showing is the deflection of the system as the span part, sorry, as the train passes over. And you can see the kind of orangey red area that, um, as you would expect with the cantilever, is longer. It's deflecting more. Um, so that's a deflection check that we've undertaken to one of the UIC codes, and um, the. The second check that we've undertaken is a frequency check. Um, so this video here shows um, the modal response calculated by MIDAS. This is the fundamental kind of bending mode, longitudinal bending mode um, of the GERDA. This second one is the fundamental torsional mode. So you can see the whole thing moving in torsion there, uh, again, of the GERDA as a whole. And then the third case that we looked at is actually the local fundamental mode of the cantilever itself, particularly where it's widest. 
and you can see the cantilever moving up and down there, so a kind of transverse uh, mode, if you like. And what we've then done is plotted the natural frequency of each of those modes uh, onto the graphs from the UIC, and you can see that all of those fall within the shaded area, and so um, the dynamic approach in the UIC is consistent with our structural response, which is good. There are other um, tracks checks you have to undertake to the UIC, so particularly local track deformation, and these uh, are covered in UIC 776 Part 3, which talks about twisting the track, and it also talks about the movement of the track over bridge piers, particularly between simple spans. As the girders move independent to each other, it bends the rail over the pier. Um, and for track fixing, there's actually a requirement to check the stress in the rail. Um, so here's a model that we've used to do this. This is actually two spans end-to-end, -end, and we've included uh, the rails in this model. And then we have um, modeled that with a train passing over the rail, uh, and we have extracted from that the envelope of stresses which occur in the rail, uh, which you can see at the bottom there. And those are within the allowable limits of the UIC. So we verified by that process that this, the deck provides sufficient stiffness uh, to protect the rail. The final check I just want to talk through, which I think there's been other modest presentations on, so I won't go into too much detail, um, but it's an important part of MRT design, uh, is to check this, the interaction between the rail and the structure. So with continuously welded, welded rail, uh, or CWR as it's known, generally there are very long lengths of rails, rails and those are placed, then welded together and pre-tensioned. Um, and by doing that, joints in the rails are eliminated, which has a significant benefit in terms of maintenance. And it's very typical uh, for MRT systems now all over the world. The CWR itself is designed to resist thermal stresses, so it doesn't buckle every time it expands. But it's important to recognize that the actual stresses which occur in the rail are a function of the structural movement, and in particular the stiffness of the structure. Um, and it's the combination of the rail and the structure acting together which distributes longitudinal loads such as thermal effects, traction and braking loads, and creep and shrinkage effects. And one of the important parts of the structural design is to check um, that the structure is stiff enough to keep the rail stresses within allowable limits, and those are provided by UIC 7743, and you can see them there. The other benefit of the analysis is that it, it predicts accurate, accurately what the longitudinal forces on the bearings and the substructure below are, because in reality, if you take traction and braking, for example, although the longitudinal load is applied over the length of the train, the effect of the longitudinal stiffness of the rail is to distribute those forces back over a large number of piers, and that reduces the forces that are actually carried by each individual bearing or pier. It's particularly important where you've got non-uniform span arrangements because those tend to see the highest load effects. Um, and in order to model it properly, long stretches of the structure have to be modeled because it's all about seeing how the, the force distributes over a large number of substructures. Um, so this is an example of uh, part of one of our models. This model is over um, two kilometers long. Um, and you can see that we're just modeling the substructure, so we're not including um, platforms and roofs in the stations, but we're just modeling everything underneath the viaduct level, which will provide stiffness. These are the essential parts of um, a model which considers rail structure interaction, um, which I won't go into, but the key thing is how the rail effectively is connected um, to the substructure. So um, the connection between the rail and the deck itself by, is actually non-linear. We use a bilinear spring, and that's defined by the UIC code. And then we provide um, links that carry those forces down to the bearings at the diaphragm spans, and then the bearings themselves have to be accurately modeled. Um, We've shown the seismic restraint there, but in reality, that link is disengaged because it doesn't come into contact under service loads. This is a, a summary of um, 
the elements which need to be included in the model from UIC 7743. Um, and as I said, it's the link between the track, so the rail and the structure needs to be carefully considered and effectively that's a nonlinear response which represents the behavior of um, the clip between the track and the diet fixing, um, the sleeper, um, and the ballast if applicable. And you can see plotted at the bottom there is, is the bilinear behavior of those springs for different cases. So it varies whether the track is loaded or unloaded and it varies depending on the fixing between the rail and the structure. Then we apply, we apply loading from the train, so we apply vertical loading and longitudinal loading, and we apply thermal loads and we apply creep and shrinkage. And although the analysis is non-linear because of those bilinear springs, the UIC code actually allows linear superposition of um, the results from the different cases, so from the thermal case and the braking case and the bending case, and those can actually be added together um, thanks to that clause which is quoted at the bottom. So that's an approximation but it's an approximation which is um, dictated by the UIC code. So these are the typical results that we get from that kind of analysis showing the variation of rail stress, uh, axial rail stress, and you can see particularly through the station areas uh, the peaks that you get and the variation in stress which occurs in the non-uniform uh, spans. In the case of Jakarta MRT um, we found that the stresses the maximum variation in rail stress was 67 newtons per millimetre squared, which is within the allowable limits. And uh, the other plot at the bottom there just shows the difference in bearing force, uh, or the reduction in bearing force that you can calculate if you do a proper RSI analysis, as opposed to uh, just, for example, applying all your traction and braking force onto one uh, span you can see the significant reduction in bearing force which occurs when we actually consider the true behavior of the rail distributing those forces back over a large number of piers. So significant benefit in the bearing design uh, from considering that. So that's a very brief uh, summary of rail structure effects, but I think it's really important uh, to consider them because I think often the structural engineers, it's not something we necessarily think about, but actually in terms of performance of the MRT as a whole, the interaction between the structure and the rail is something that we need to understand uh, because we need to provide structures which have sufficient stiffness to ensure that the track and the trains perform adequately as intended. So just two slides to summarize. In terms of structural design for MRTs, I, the early decisions are vital. Construction technique, what is the critical loading case? Um, and seismic design needs to be carefully considered as if it's applicable, particularly if there's a serviceability earthquake. Um, and that if there is, the relative magnitudes of the serviceability in the ultimate earthquake need to be carefully considered. On the one hand, the higher the serviceability earthquake, the safer the structure. But on the other hand, um, the closer it comes to the ultimate earthquake, the more it will dominate and material quantities can spiral very quickly if we're not careful. In terms of um, MRT structures in general, grouping structures, there are so many spans on a structure like this, you need to group them in order to ensure that the design is efficient, but also to ensure that construction is repeatable so we get the quality benefit that comes from that. And we need to consider, consider as I said, the interaction between the track um, and the structural effects. In terms of using MIDAS Civil um, in particular for MRT systems, uh, Again, right at the start, thinking through how are we going to get repetition in modeling in order to ensure that the design process is standardized. And it is invaluable to spend time thinking at the start what the output you'll need from the models will be. How will the results be extracted? What, will, what results will you need? How will they be processed? Uh, and then the model can be designed to accommodate that. Um, construction staging is fundamental. Um, for the longitudinal designs, but also for MRT jobs like this, large scale models are inevitable um, for partly for the substructure design, for the moving load analysis, particularly for rail structure interaction and for seismic effects. So there's going to be some processing power required for that. And I hope this has come across throughout the presentation, but I just want to finish by emphasizing that it's great to have the finite element analysis 
and it's a fantastic tool for the engineer. But we cannot forget the importance of simple handshakes uh, to verify what comes out of it. Checking deformations, checking checking critical forces, checking the load path, checking uh, fundamental results. Um, these are things which are simple to do and just give us confidence in the results that we're using to design these structures. So that's all I want to say. Thank you for your attention.